Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, this is uh, the fourth episode of uh, Hodinkee Live. Uh, I am Hodinkee Editor-in-Chief Jack Forster, and today I'm here with uh, someone who's appearing on Hodinkee Live for the first time, but uh, someone who all of our regular readers know. This is Mr. Louis Westphalen. Hi. Um, who is our uh, vintage watch expert. He's the uh, brains and the eyes behind uh, Friday's Bring a Loop and quite a lot of our other uh, best love content. And uh, we're going to start off today by talking just a little bit about uh, some of the interesting things that are happening in the industry. As uh, regular Hodinkee viewers know, uh, this is a little bit of a challenging time for uh, the Swiss watch industry. Um, there have been uh, de you know, declines in sales kind of across the board in pretty much every market. And uh, this has affected the industry uh, not just in terms of what we see as consumers, but in terms of what's going on in the industry as well. So we got a sort of an interesting piece of news this week. As, uh, as many of you probably know, uh, the Swatch Group uh, historically has been, been one of the biggest suppliers of uh, movements to companies that don't have the capacity or the desire to manufacture their own movements, uh, but who create watches. And uh, a couple of years ago, in 2013, an agreement was struck uh, that would allow the Swatch Group to kind of dial back the number of movements that it was supplying in a gradual way so as not to produce too great an impact on the industry. Uh, and we've heard, uh, of course, uh, very, we've heard recently, uh, just within the last week, that the orders that the Swatch Group has received have uh, dropped rather significantly, and this has had some repercussions for uh, what the group is uh, going to be doing in the future. Louis, perhaps you could fill us yeah, in on that. Yeah, so, so basically, if you go back in time, um, around 2011, uh, Swatch was talking um, with the competition committee uh, to decrease or like stop um, f uh, providing movements to other right. brands. You know? right. So the original um, desire on the part of the Swatch group was actually to... To stop. To stop completely. Um, and at the time, like, it was not possible to stop at once because it would have put a lot of other brands at risk uh, of you know, not being able to produce any watch without any movement. So what they did is like gradually over time decrease um, the, the number of, of movements provided uh, until 2019. Um, right. and, and now what's happening, we are 2017, um, and Squatch would like to go to the 2019 level, meaning provide less movements than what was agreed because they have less orders. And what's happening right now is that they, are, they still have to produce the, the movements that were agreed on even though they don't have orders, and as, as they were so, mentioning. So just, just to back up, they're being held to an agreement that was made in 2013. Exactly. They're being held to production levels that were established when the environment was a little bit different. Completely different, because yeah. also the, the, the number that they have to reach every year is a percentage of the production, of the average of the production between 2009 and 2011. Right, right. So you can imagine that the production was very different than it is today. And what's happening as well is, and that was you know, why uh, this agreement came, came in force in the first place, is that people found, or like brands found other ways to, to get movements, either going to a third party supplier, um, you know, like Celita, Soprod, or, or Rodana, mm -hmm. uh, Roda. Um, Otherwise, they just like created the capacity themselves, and that's what we've seen with right. Tudor, for instance. Right. Yeah, so we've uh, and we've seen that we've we've written about this and, ta and talked about it on live. Also, we've uh, seen an interesting situation where uh, Breitling, for example, and Tudor yeah. have reached an arrangement to supply each other with movements uh, which do not require, obviously, uh, movements from a third-party supplier exactly. like yeah. like Swatch or Salita. Yeah, and Swatch is actually mentioning right now that you know some of their biggest. Uh, former clients are, are dropping out, and that's why they have also this decrease right. in orders. Right. Um, and, and those, the one mentioned uh, by Swatch, are actually Tudor and Celita. Right. Um, right. And, and Celita, it's kind of like indirect because they, are, they were assembling movements from Swatch, but you see that you know, their orders have effectively dropped by half. So the, uh, one of the uh, major reports that we saw covering the situation was in uh, Le Temps, uh, yeah. a Swiss newspaper published in Geneva. In and French. the figures in French, yep. And uh, the figures that they gave were... Uh, 1.5 million is the production that Swatch needs to, to do. Per the 2013 agreement. Uh, yeah. That's the requirement. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, uh, and they, they lost um, 700,000, um, like, they are short of 700,000 Se So, so the year, year over year, they're 700,000 units down this exactly. year relative to yeah. last year, which is, uh, seems pretty dramatic. And, and also, like, one of the... The side effects that Swatch is, is mentioning actually is that you know if they have to produce that that number that huge number of, of movements but they don't um, find clients for them, it means that the, the existing client have to pay more for right. for right. their movements and it's kind of like it's it's 
it's increasing the speed uh, of the of the of the effect basically because right. they have this fixed cost that they need to amortize on on their orders. And this is this is kind of an undesirable situation for everybody because of course those costs which are the result of uh, an agreement that was made under yeah. circumstances that are no longer enforced those costs eventually end up getting passed on to consumers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that's uh, that's an extremely interesting uh, development and obviously it's going to play out uh, the consequences are going to play out rather slowly over the next few years, but still something very interesting to watch. Yeah. The other big piece of industry news today was that the Richemont Group has uh, released its figures for the end of its fiscal year, which ends in uh, May. Uh, so they've released their 2017 mm -hmm. results. And, uh, you know, it's not um, uh, as rosy, obviously, as everyone would like under ideal circumstances. Uh, however, uh, there, is a, so, there is some sign of recovery in some significant markets, uh, the U.S. and mainland China, mm -hmm. which have uh, you know, historically been very, very important markets uh, for the Swiss watch industry and for the Richemont Group. Those are actually showing strong signs of recovery as well. Um, and uh, so there's a hope, I think, uh, that can be taken away from all of this that uh, perhaps the worst of the decline that we've seen in the last two and a half to three years is over. And as markets continue to recover, as people start to travel again, as tourists begin to uh, purchase in locations yeah. like Paris, for example, uh, we'll start to see uh, a better, better situation for the group and for Agreed, uh, and, and I think also uh, Richemont is uh, uh, showing that is, it's reacting as well, um, mm -hmm. and so that's why you've seen you know so many new CEOs, new organization. Uh, they right. also want like more diversity um, in CEOs. You, you saw like the nomination of a female CEO for Piaget, for instance. That's right, um, Ms. Chabi um, Nouri, uh, first uh, Richemont um, watch and jewelry maison, international brand president, new one in some time. And what they announced um, uh, actually uh, right now is also that they, they are embracing digital way more and they have new candidates with very right. strong digital backgrounds. Um, so you see like this diversity of starting to, to be in place. And of course, uh, the Richemont Group has an extremely uh, healthy balance sheet. They have almost uh, six billion in cash on hand. So doing well in that respect. All right. Um, so this is also auction season. Yes. This uh, weekend. Which is something in which uh, Louis and a lot of our readers uh, take a very deep interest. Uh, Louis, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about some of the lots that you saw that you think are particularly interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess you, you all know the, the big lots, um, you know, um, like presented by Philips, by Christie's. So um, we've written about them. So I wanted to do something like different. Um, and I read the catalogs, it was probably like the fourth or the fifth time, and I tried to find watches that we kind of like never talk about, uh, but that, that are really interesting, at least to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so for each, for each auction house, I'll, I'll pick one. Um, I'll start with Philips, um, and okay. they have a breguet from the 1950s. It's not the first time that they have a time-only breguet from the 1950s, um, but I think those watches are exceptionally beautiful. They are full of breguet DNA. You know, you see the guilloche dial, um, you see the coin H case, you see the, we, in French we call it the palm, palm hands. Right, um, right. The, uh, what we typically in English call breguet, breguet, breguet style. hands. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so it's like in terms of, of design, it's, it's gorgeous. Um, in terms of uh, mechanical, um, you know, what you have inside, um, you have a Puzzle 260 which is an incredible uh, manual one movement that was used and you know, won a lot of um, chronometer uh, competition. Um, so yeah, in a lot of respects, that's actually sort of like the classic supplied yeah. high quality hand wound movement. Exactly, and a lot era. of friends um, actually purchased um, this, this, this exact movement mm -hmm. uh, for their chronometer pieces. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a beautiful, very interesting watch that you see rarely for one reason is that like you have to remember where Breguet was in the 1950s. Like it was not, you know, the, the, the brand like selling worldwide as we know now. Right, right. It was like in Paris, barely surviving. Um, I mean, probably survived thanks to the army, the Type 20, but time only, they were probably making a couple of hundreds every year. Right. Um, right. And you see even like that they were not selling quickly. I think they were like mostly selling to French people, right, um, right. and it's and it's 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 just like it's really charming to think about this these exceptional watches that no one knew about uh, that were like sitting in Paris and staying in Paris uh, and produced in so few. So this is sort of a national pride choice it's for you. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Um, so what else we have? So the um, the the second one uh, at Christie's, it's actually not a wristwatch. Um, it's an Atmos, um, and it's not like a regular Atmos. It's one of the very first ones uh, since it has been um, made in 1934. Um, and 
I don't know if you're familiar with the Atmos, but it's, it's a fascinating engineering solution to perpetual movement. Um, you know, it's not like you, you can think of the automatic watch, but like how do you make that happen on a watch that's sitting on, on your desk? On a clock, sure. On a clock. Um, and, and so the solution that uh, one engineer um, found in 1927 uh, was actually uh, to use the different, the, like the very small uh, difference in temperatures um, as to, with some gas, as to power the movement. Um, and so you see those, those clocks that are just sitting in a room and like magically keep on working. Um, Apparently indefinitely. Yeah. yeah. Off uh, minute, minute temperature changes. And this particular clock was from? Uh, so it's, it's, it's signed at most because it's, yeah. it's one of the very um, early ones. Mm -hmm. uh, it's already um, when the agreement was placed with um, Jaeger, mm -hmm. who, become, um, who became actually the, um, uh, the sole provider of, mm -hmm. or like the, the sole provider of this invention. And then, you know, a branded those type of clocks, right. uh, right. Right. Uh, Again, there might be some French pride in there because uh, they Maybe. were mostly sold in Paris in the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but like, regardless, it's it's beautiful. And what I liked about it also is that it's not in yellow gold, mm -hmm. um, as were the, the first examples. So it's it's it doesn't look dated at all. So, Mr. Westphalen, we're two for two on the French pride traces. So what do you? What's uh, up for number three? Um, number three is yeah, it's um, it's at Sotheby's. Um, it's, it's a Patek Philippe, but definitely not the one you're expecting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I would almost say it's like one of the ugly ducks at Patek Philippe. Um, in the Ooh. sense, like, I feel the ellipse... Just hold my ears. Uh, the ellipse collection gets quite overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, it's very dressy, it's very beautiful. Um, it has a great history because it was um, designed by Gérard Genta in 1968. Um, yet you know, you hear way more about the chronographs or like the complicated watches. Right, right. Um, and it just like, it's, it's a very, very interesting watch um, that has a lot of presence, mm -hmm. uh, especially that example, because um, it's from uh, 1973 and it definitely shows. Um, you have, you know, you're, you're, you're not at the golden ellipse from, from Gérard Genta mm -hmm. that was designed five years before. You're way more like the 70 funky, right, funky case. Right, right. Um, and what I like about it as well is um, the blue dial um, that's like very Patek. They have this almost unique blue color mm -hmm. um, that, that's really, really beautiful. And I, I don't think I've seen any other brand. Maybe Vacheron in, in, in the 70s also had that color. But it's, it's very unique. And I, so I feel, you know, it's a, it's a Patek that like, deserves more attention than it gets. So two for French pride and one for kind of a pop art funk. Yes. Uh, so um, what's next? So the, the last one, uh, it's Atlantic Rome. Um, and we, we go back in time um, because it's actually from the 50s. Um, it's an Omega constellation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, everyone knows the, the constellation. Um, this one is kind of like a premium constellation, I would call it. Um, you see that, I mean, it's in, in rose gold, so it's a good start, but you really see that uh, from the dial. Uh, it's a cloisonné dial um, and like stunning, you know, it's like those. Yeah, this, this series of uh, enamel dial constellations are, I, I think, some of the most beautiful wristwatches ever made, so I'm, I'm definitely with you on yeah. this one. And, and just like the, the motif on it, uh, mm -hmm. it's called the Observatory, uh, which is quite fitting because the watch itself is a, is a chronometer certified uh, piece. Um, but it's, it's really, really beautiful. Um, and you know, something that you would not find produced nowadays. Uh, uh, speaking of funky, yes. we have uh, one more object. It's, uh, it's not a wristwatch. Uh, it's part of a, a fairly old tradition um, that you really don't see that much of anymore of putting, uh, putting watches. Yeah. Uh, in uh, practical objects. So you want to tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah, so um, I mean, this is definitely not a watch. <laughs> it's definitely it's not, not a watch. watch. Um, it's, um, it's a parrot form um, handle. Um, and for, a, for a walking stick. For a walking stick. Yeah. And like inside you see uh, both a clock and also a, like a musical complication. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's something that like doesn't look like it has any function. But it's, it's almost unique and it's very charming um, to think about, you know, how complicated that was to, to just fit so much uh, into, into that, that strange shape. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's made in, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. So right, you, right. you have to think about... Like, Which was a very fanciful time for watch yeah. and clock making, actually. It was sort of the beginning of precision timekeeping, but there was still a lot of kind of, you know, just like wacky decorative stuff being done. 
Yeah. So that I would love to, to see and you know, yeah. you actually used. Um, That'd be a fun thing to walk around with. I, I think that, that would be a good one for you. I have a persistent memory of, and I'm sure that it can't be right, I, I, I believe that I saw at one point a watch actually set into the stock of a, uh, into the handle of a pistol. And I, I must be imagining it because I can't think of a worse place to put yeah. a delicate 19th century. Uh, it'd just be a ter terrible, terrible thing to do. All right. Uh, another thing we thought we'd talk about since uh, summer is rushing towards us uh, are uh, dive watches, which are sort of, they're a great year round watch for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but Louie and I thought we'd talk a little bit about a couple of our favorites uh, from the recent uh, Baselworld yeah. show. And uh, Louis, you have uh, you have a couple in mind? Yeah, uh, I mean the first the first one is quite obvious actually. Um, it's mm -hmm. uh, the Sea Dweller, the new Sea Dweller, a very controversial controversial watch uh, in good and bad. I would say uh, <laughs> everyone everyone has has an opinion about it. Right. Um, it's, What's the bad? The bad is just because if you look at the previous Sea Dweller, they were always like forty millimeter right. uh, with a side lap, right. and here you were like forty three millimeter. Um, we, uh, sorry, they were without, and now they're with, with the cyclops. The cyclops. Um, and, and so it changed, but I think it's a very smart choice from from Rolex. Um, and you know, if you're like into vintage, I don't think you you, you like that that much. Uh, but at the same time, you, you have to remember that it's like modern times, and that Rolex they are actually catering to some clients that they were not really touching. Right, uh, people right. who like slightly bigger cases. I mean, it is also, I mean, the Cyclops at least is a more practical choice yeah. if you want the date to be visible. Well, True. the Cyclops yeah. helps make the date more visible. So it's, uh, it's as practical there as it is on any other uh, Rolex with a date in the Cyclops. Yeah. How much of the problem do you think is uh, that the changes are uh, objectively not good changes and that people just don't like it when Rolex changes anything? The, the latter. <laughs> it's 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 hundred percent the latter. Yeah. And it's also like it's not the you know it's not the clients for, yeah. for the like it's not the potential clients for this piece that right. are complaining. Right. Um, I the only thing that like um, left me sw some question on, on this watch. I mean it's 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 an outstanding watch. You know you get the Rolex engineering. Uh, it's waterproof to um, four thousand feet. Like where we are never gonna go. Um, and it's you know it's not like on purpose. Yeah, at yeah. Least, yeah, it's extremely solid. So there is nothing to say uh, about yeah. the quality of the watch. Right. Uh, right. The one thing that was interesting, it was the like an, kind of anniversary piece for mm -hmm. for the Sidwell, and that's why they pu they put the the red line, uh, which was kind of, of a nod of the first prototype from the Sidwell. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to remind folks uh, we are doing we are finishing with the Q and A. So. Uh, if you want to leave us uh, questions in the article that we just posted on, uh, on the website, uh, you can also uh, send us questions in YouTube. Um, so, you know, just send, send them on in. So, yeah, the, the red line is just a nod to the vintage, and it's okay. at the same time. Maybe it's ironical uh, of them. It's like a nod to the vintage and still, like, very different in shape than the vintage. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. You, you can never really tell for sure what Rolex's intentions are with uh, yeah. this subtle playing with vintage cues, and, of course, Rolex will never tell. True. Uh, I mean, for me, the most fun uh, dive watch uh, of the show was the, uh, the reissue of the Seiko 62 MAS. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was uh, just, uh, I mean, there was so much to, uh, to like there. You have a, a completely classic uh, look, but it's, uh, it's been updated, obviously, technically. So you kind of have all the best of, uh, uh, you know, the old school uh, you know, 62 MAS, 6217, uh, combined with uh, characteristics of modern wristwatch, caliber 8L35, Self-winding movement, running at a f you know a fairly high frequency, 28,800 VPH, uh, 60 hour power reserve. Um, so again, you've got you've got great you know it's a lot of what people who are interested in uh, vintage style watches want in terms of style. In fact, it's pretty much everything you could ask. Uh, but again, it's a technically very advanced yeah. watch as well. It's you know it, it, it's essentially a, a 62 62 MAS uh, Grand Seiko really. Yeah, and I, I would say like on the Grand Seiko note note. Um, I really uh, was impressed with the finishing of the case. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like the, the watch, when you handle the watch, you have a feeling of quality um, that just like jumps at you, uh, which is, you know, kind of like interesting for a diving watch. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I would definitely like, vintage wise, this was a very interesting release. Um, I have another one uh, that's also. Um, 
playing with the same vintage feel, uh, actually from the same period. Um, it's the Blancpain tribute to uh, 50 uh, Phantoms, mm -hmm. uh, the mild spec one, the mild yes, spec edition. Yes, 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 which, um, uh, which was you know, a, a great kind of knockout surprise for those of us yeah. who, uh, who saw it at the show. Um, and, and so it's, it's a nod, uh, again, to a model from the 1960s mm -hmm. uh, that had a very interesting feature because it had um, kind of like a, a round uh, indicator, uh, which was a um, half, um, like yellow, half white. Mm -hmm. And um, when the white turns into yellow, uh, you know that you're in trouble because it means that you have water inside your watch. Right. Um, and so they, they did it again. Um, and I think like now the watch is waterproof to 300 meters. Uh, it's you know, the modern engineering, so I think there is less chances that this would happen. But it's, it's a very fun symbol, and it looks great on the watch. Terrific. And again, the watch is uh, 40 millimeter, um, and you get uh, a lot of things uh, that people love, such as the ceramic bezel. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's really good good looking watch it's a limited edition uh to 500 pieces great all right i think we're going to go ahead uh and take a look at uh, something people ask us fairly frequently uh, yeah. uh which is uh the watches that we are actually wearing and um the watch that i'm wearing this week is uh something that uh, we don't see very often here in the united states and i certainly don't see terribly often in the office but it's a it's a very very interesting watch from a very interesting guy this is the christoph clary maestro uh, and it is uh, a watch um, made by, so Christophe Claret, uh, for those of you who don't know, is probably one of the best known, uh, historically was one of the best known uh, suppliers of complicated movements to the watch industry, minute repeaters and tourbillons. Uh, you know, for many, many years, he was one of the very few individuals from which you could get a complicated movement if you wanted to uh, have a complicated movement in, in, uh, uh, in your own watch. And uh, several years ago, he started creating I guess he got tired of putting uh, his movements in other people's watches. And uh, for a while now, he's been creating uh, really, really technically interesting watches under his own uh, brand name. So uh, this one has uh, a number of cool features. The first thing that you notice about it, of course, is uh, the architecture of the bridges. So this is a very, very, very old style of movement design. Uh, it's actually derived from uh, the very early English uh, pocket watch movement and bridge design you know, kind of idioms. Uh, we've got a 70-hour power reserve out of uh, a couple of very, very large barrels. And uh, we've got two really interesting features um, that I can't remember uh, seeing on uh, any other watch. Uh, so the first one is this, I mean, it's always dangerous to say firsts in watchmaking, but uh, this looks uh, unique-ish to me. So we've got a cone here which actually indicates the date, uh, upper digits uh, for the tens digits and lower digits for the ones digits. It's the 12th today. And uh, over here we've got Claret is fond of these kind of quirky little um, co uh, small complications, you might call them. This is uh, an aid memoir. This is something to, uh, it's, it's like t uh, the old habit of tying a knot in the corner of your uh, handkerchief to remember something. So you can actually operate uh, this pusher uh, and change the orientation of the cone. Uh, and depending on the position it's in, hopefully you have good enough memory to remember what it is that you're supposed to be reminded of. Uh, when the cone is in that position. But again, a very clever and kind of characterful way of doing things. Yeah. And Louis, I think you've got something too? Yeah, uh, I mean, my this choice... Is one, this is one I see on, on your wrist a lot. I know. Um, so it's, it's more simple in... Uh, mechanically, I would say. Um, yet, so it's a vintage Piaget, mm -hmm. uh, manually wound, um, very slim, 9P. Nine, nine um, uh, it's with the 9P caliber. Um, and you know that's a caliber that was one of the slimmest caliber, uh, manually worn caliber right. uh, released in 1956. Um, and I love this watch because I, I almost cannot find anything about it. And I think um, like that's fairly rare. I've only found uh, another one sold um, at auction at Antiquorum. Oh, you mean you haven't seen this particular? No. Oh, I, like, I don't think they made a lot. Um, yeah. uh, Maybe it was a bit weird for, for the time. Um, and this what, one, what year was this again? Uh, this one was produced in 1969. 1969. Um, and so I, I cannot find a lot of information about it. Um, I've, I've asked Piaget as well, and they don't have much either. Um, the one yeah. thing that I, that I know um, is, you know, the, the, this case shape um, is very reminiscent of Gilbert Albert. I'm like 99.9% sure. Gilbert Albert, the, the designer of uh, the, the, the very, uh, the Patek Philippe from the 1960s. Uh, he did the Ricochet collection uh, and he had this um, 
these designs where it's basically you see the movement in mm -hmm. the case mm -hmm. um, as opposed to you know a very traditional round case or like square it's something in between uh, and here you have that especially on the case pens um, which are kind of like rounded um, and so the, the watch has a very different profile uh, than you would expect and I find it interesting because you're basically taking one of the slimmest movements ever made and you're making like a, a thicker case around it. Right, right. Uh, so it's quite ironical and it's, it actually works really great on the wrist. Um, and irony is sort of a favored uh, maybe, idiom maybe so, yeah. for the French anyway. Probably, yeah. Hence the appeal. All right. Uh, we're going to wrap things up now with, uh, we, we don't act, have an actual mailbag that we can pretend to reach into. Maybe that's coming. Uh, but we're going to take, uh, uh, take some questions uh, from uh, readers. And um, uh, we also have a, a very, very interesting question, uh, which we got f um, in response to one of the stories that we ran earlier this week. Um, and it was, uh, uh, a qu the question was, it's one of those uh, sort of obvious sounding things um, that none of us ever really think about, yeah. you know, where certain habits kind of get started. Uh, the question was from uh, Matteo Rossi. And he asked, is a Calatrava just a time-only watch, or does it need to have some special specifications to be considered a Calatrava? So this is actually a question with a very complicated answer. Uh, we don't really have time to go into the whole story, but what this, uh, what this base, what, where this question comes from is that there are a lot of different Patek Philippe watches called Calatravas. Mm -hmm. And the first one, uh, the earliest watch that Patek Philippe made, which we call a Calatrava nowadays, it's 96. Cal yeah, so ref uh, reference 96. Uh, early 1930s, but mm -hmm. at the time they would not call it the, the right. Calatrava. Right. Uh, it was kind of like applied um, afterwards. Um, and, you know, the, the reason why Calatrava is associated to Patek Philippe is just the, the logo. The, it's a symbol of, right. um, it's a Calatrava cross, so it's a symbol of, uh, of Patek Philippe. Right. right. Um, so, and the first, uh, the first time that Patek Philippe actually used the word Calatrava themselves to describe a watch was in the mid-1980s. Yeah. Surprisingly late, with a reference 3919. Exactly, yeah. The Calatrava cross itself is a very, it's a much older symbol than the Patek Philippe. It actually goes back to the uh, 11th century, more or less. Uh, and it was uh, the symbol uh, for the Order of Calatrava, which was a, a militia, as it was called, uh, you know, sort of a, a military arm of the, yeah. of the Catholic Church at the time. And um, uh, no one really seems to know why Antoine Norbert de Patek uh, chose it as the symbol of uh, Patek Philippe, started appearing on Patek Philippe watch cases in the 1870s, was registered by them as a trademark in the late 1880s, uh, but exactly why no one seems to know. And um, uh, there has been some speculation that it uh, represents uh, Antoine Norbert de Patek's uh, aspirations f uh, for uh, Poland to become uh, a Catholic uh, country. Yeah. Uh, but again, nobody knows for sure. So uh, kind of fascinating history, but with a lot of uncertainty about uh, where it actually comes from. And as for the style of the watches, like it doesn't, it's not enough, you know, to be a time-only watch to be called a Calatrava. It's not enough to be a time-only uh, Patek Philippe and be called a Calatrava. Mm -hmm. um, I think, like design-wise, um, it's it stems from the '96, from the reference '96, and it's um, it's about you know having kind of like a very balanced style. Uh, very simple design, but also this kind of um, straight uh, edges for the case and uh, often like a flat bezel. Mm -hmm. um, that's like basically what people uh, think when they are thinking get out travel. Interesting. All right, so we're going we're gonna to take one more from the comments. Um, uh, BB911 uh, is asking, will the second hand market follow the financial trend of Richemont? So my guess is that the question here is, is there going to be a, a softening of the second-hand market as well? Now, the first thing, of course, is that we have to distinguish between the pre-owned market and the vintage market. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and both markets are, it's a little bit harder to sort of see how they will respond uh, in terms of what's going on with newer watches. In a lot of respects, I think they're kind of, um, they're kind of different audiences. Certainly the audience for vintage is not necessarily the audience for, for modern watches. Yeah, and it's also the, the production level of, of vintage pieces is nothing comparable to what has been done recently. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, the thing is, um, I guess the brands are adjusting their production uh, levels themselves. Um, so I don't really expect the, the second-hand market to like, change drastically. Um, if you're talking like only about second-hand market and not gray market, which is like something completely different. Right. Right. Um, and as far as vintage is concerned, it just seems to be getting stronger. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, you see that in cars as well. Um, it just, 
you know, it's it's something special to to find a, a vintage watch. Mm -hmm. um, it's a different experience. You know, it, like you can find it reassuring to to buy a brand new wa watch in a boutique, but like finding you know after a long quest, finding a watch and like you know, there is always the uncertainty that everything can be right, it, some things can be wrong. So I think it's it's very different, and you see people you know either going only one way or people doing both. Um, so I think both markets at least are nothing in common. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, it's uh, been great having you with us, Louis, and uh, obviously um, you know, a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous amount of stuff that uh, we'll, we hopefully we'll be hearing from Louis about the vintage market, about vintage collecting, and about uh, some of these really uh, special vintage pieces like this beautiful and unexpected uh, Piaget that he brought in to share with us today. And uh, we'll see you all next week. See you soon. <laughs>